This is Sunderland, home of the greatest football team in the universe, but that's another story. It's a grey and rainy day, and I'm 230 miles from my farm back in Cambridgeshire. But in all other respects, I'm in a different world. Fifteen years ago, this shipyard employed 3,000 people and built enormous ships. Where I am right now, they used to build things that were 600 feet long and weighed 30,000 tons. Today, if they're lucky, they employ 300 people and there isn't a ship to be seen. Why? And the answer is simple. There were too many ships being built and the government cut off all the subsidies. And yet, in my industry, in farming, there's too much wheat being grown and the government still keeps paying me a whacking great subsidy check every year. Farmers like to portray themselves as sturdy, independent businessmen. Actually, we're as independent as a ventriloquist dummy. We receive four billion pounds a year from the taxpayer and, as a result, we're the last great subsidized industry, but we'd rather nobody knew. While this yard was being closed in the 1980s, I was enjoying the greatest prosperity farming has ever known. There aren't many survivors in the yards from those days, but Paul Newton is one of them. How did you feel when you were told the yard was going to close? Right, same as everybody else, devastated at the time, because there was nothing to look forward to, no work, nothing. But then how do you feel when you hear that a farmer, me for example, I'm, I'm a big farmer and I get a cheque every year from the government for about 180,000 quid because they want me to stay in business and they want to help me. How do you feel when you hear that? Well, why couldn't they keep us in business then? Why could they not keep us going? If they could subsidise other people, why couldn't they subsidise us? You're a working man, the same as everybody else. But obviously they're not making you redundant. They're giving you money, why couldn't they give us money? Good question, and I just don't know the answer. Why is it that farming is treated better than any other industry in the country? Take my own farm, for example. I run 2,000 acres at Triplo near Cambridge. We don't have any animals, just crops. It's a modern, fairly efficient business, and we had a very good harvest in the summer. In any sane world, we ought to be able to stand on our own two feet. Yet I still get my lovely big subsidy check at Christmas. Under the system which exists today, I need this check, but it's a damn stupid system. Subsidies are only half the story of the common agricultural policy. And in this program, I'll be dealing with some of the other special privileges agriculture receives. My fellow farmers are keeping stumm and wishing I'd do the same. Take what's happened to my barley, which we store in these 50-foot high bins. The barley harvest is now over and, in the words of the hymn, all is safely gathered in, all 875 tons which meant it was a good harvest at just over three tons an acre. So for that reason, I was a happy farmer. But the price is terrible. And for that reason, I'm a very unhappy farmer indeed. Thank God, however, for Brussels. Because of the so-called intervention system, I'm going to be able to sell this barley for five pounds a ton, more than the market price. And one of these days, a huge fleet of lorries is going to come along and take all this stuff away. And this is where it comes to. Four whacking great big disused aircraft hangars somewhere in the middle of the Yorkshire Wolds. A total of 65,000 tonnes of barley just sitting here. I feel a bit like an agricultural version of Chris Bonington because I'm a third of the way down a real good old fashioned grain mountain. This one holds 14,000 tonnes of barley, which has come off, roughly speaking, 4,500 acres of land. But to understand why there are grain mountains, it's necessary to go back a bit in history. And after the war, when the CAP was being invented by tired and hungry politicians, they had to promise farmers that the prices wouldn't collapse. And so they said to the farmers of Europe, don't worry, we will guarantee you a minimum price. And if you can't sell your barley on the open market, we'll buy it. And that's what they're doing here. They'll store this barley for God knows how many years until they can find a buyer, even if it means losing money. 
Controlling the grain supply sounds sensible enough, but it encourages me to go on producing more and more barley, regardless of whether or not anybody actually wants the stuff. I suppose it isn't really surprising that farmers like me love the intervention system. After all, this has enabled me to sell my barley for 70 pounds a tonne, and without it, I possibly couldn't sell it at all. But the fact remains that the whole system is crazy. Can you imagine any other industry benefiting from an intervention system? Imagine a dishwasher company that couldn't sell its dishwashers. And imagine here, instead of barley, stretching from floor to ceiling, dishwashers shrink-wrapped in plastic. We'd say it was crazy, and the people who would say it was crazy longest and loudest would be farmers, because, as usual, there's a strong streak of hypocrisy in farmers. This grain mountain is actually an obscenity. And the reason it's an obscenity is because there are millions of people right now dying of starvation simply because they don't have this to eat. And on the face of it, something's got to be crazy about the world for this to happen. But really, the problem is rather simple. The real reason is that the people who are dying of starvation don't have the money to buy this, and the politicians here in this country don't want to spend the money to send it to them. Anyway, shipping food to hungry countries should only be done as emergency famine relief. If you just dump our grain mountains into the third world, you'll destroy the local agriculture and do far more harm than good. Barely a mile from that grain mountain is one of Britain's most productive farms. Peter Hepworth grows crops on his 700 acres, which are the envy of every other arable farmer in the country. He gets incredible yields and never tires of telling lesser mortals like me. How long has a Hepworth been farming this land? 1948. So that's 50 years? Yes. And how different would it have been when your dad then started back in 1948? There'd be a lot more weeds and a lot less crop, basically. How much less crop? Just under half. That would be quite a good yield in those days. From, so, from sort of in acres, if he got two tonnes an acre, it was doing very nicely. And today you'd expect four or five, perhaps. So you've doubled the yield in one generation? Yes. Great stuff, isn't it? Well, it is and it isn't. It's particularly poignant that you point that out, Peter, because just over there, what, a mile away, there is an intervention store full of barley, but it could equally easily have been wheat. And the only reason there's an intervention store anywhere, let alone a mile away from your farm, is because you produce so much bloody wheat, nobody knows what to do with it. Part right, only part right, of course. That's because good for me to be part right. Yes, it is good for you to be part right. But part of it is, of course, sales have been more difficult this year on the strength of the pound. But, but more than that, consumption has, of course, gone up as well. And yes, you must farm to produce a surplus. Now come off it, you're not facing the facts, and the facts are that before Hepworth produced four tonne or five tonne of wheat to the acre, there was no such thing as a grain mountain, and now there is. There's some grain mountain. Before that, though, we were importers as a nation. Today we're exporters, and I find that magnificent as a British farmer. Magnificent. We're about the fifth biggest grain exporter in the world. The trouble is, he's achieved his incredible yields at a cost to the environment, which many people think is just too high. These hedge bottoms are awfully clean, Peter. Yes, hope so. Why? Have you sprayed them? Yes. That's With... rather an antisocial thing to do. No, 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 it isn't. It's terribly social, but it's stopping weeds proliferating into the fields that would need a lot wide, more widespread treatments than what we give them. Well, what have you got against weeds in the hedges? I can see why you don't want weeds in your field of wheat, but why not in your hedge? Because the weeds just go into the field of wheat and up the herbicide costs right across the field. No, they don't. You plow oh, down yes, the they... hedge. Oh, and yes, they do. People who don't spray their hedgerows don't have weeds growing in the middle of their field because they plow. No, but they'll have a strip right round um, of, of weeds that slowly take off into the middle of the field. I think you're taking good housekeeping to a, to, 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 to a limit of total madness. No, 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 I'm not. If if one checks back, this was done by hand for 200 years at least. 
when the ladies and children would sort of go out and get so much a rude in those days for hand weeding because our ancestors knew, which I've learned a lot later, that weeds in the hedge bottom are away into the field and there's no way can you stop them. In those good old days, yes. and the word good has got inverted it's commas around very, very inverted commas, yes. There used to be, I suspect, this is a question, not a statement, an but awful lot of hedges on your farm. A few more. How many more? Oh, one or two or three or maybe Go four. Go on. You're not normally vague about figures. How many more hedges? Well, we haven't had a specific add up. What we can say is the field we're just happening to be in the corner of, even in those days, was 60 acres. How many is it now? 110. You yanked out the hedges? We did that. There were bent hedges that were difficult for modern machinery, and they made a production more efficient. And one little bit of a hedge at the wrong side of a 60-acre field is really totally neither here nor there. So in a perfect Hepworth world, a hedge would not even exist? It'd be like a dinosaur or a dodo? I think it would, to be honest, yes. That'd be a bloody miserable countryside there, wouldn't no, it? No, it wouldn't. I mean, we go down, you can look over there into Holderness, there isn't a hedge for miles. You will know, I will know, there's, there's not a hedge in Germany, in Holland there isn't a hedge. There's, it's a British phenomenon. I love Peter's blunt Yorkshireness and also his huge tractor. But even I reckon that he's taken his farming practices a bit too far. But he's only an extreme example of what every other arable farmer in the country has done in response to massive financial inducements to produce more and more and more. Before a businessman decides whether to produce flower pots or fuzzy toys, he first assesses market demand. I've never been bothered by those tedious details. All I have to do is to listen to the politicians. Now, my dad never had to worry about things like this. He just used a good old-fashioned crop rotation, following wheat with peas and barley with sugar beet and things like that. But he didn't have to worry about Brussels. Look at this folder. It's a mountain of paper. And it tells me what Brussels are going to pay me by way of subsidies. And, for example, they're going to pay me £100 an acre for every acre of cereals I grow, £173 for oilseed rape, £141 for peas and beans, and £190 for a crop that nobody in their right mind would grow around here because it yields so little. I'm talking about linseed. The Americans call this farming the system, and they're right. But it means that I know today that next year I'm going to get a cheque for £180,000 from a grateful Brussels. And I know this before I've even planted a seed in the ground. But there's one crop that all farmers hate growing, and I'm no exception. It's this, set aside. Here I've got a whacking great field doing nothing but growing weeds. Why? Because Brussels, in a desperate attempt to cut down production, has said to me, set 10% of your farm aside, and only then will we start paying you subsidies. They're also, by the way, paying me 140 quid an acre for growing weeds, which may sound like a lot of money, but actually we're losing money on it, because all our costs, except for the odd plough, fertiliser and seed, are still there. Set aside may be bad news for farmers, but it's brilliant news for birds. And for the last five years, they've been able to nest in this field almost undisturbed. Now, today, they've all flown the nest, and pretty soon we're going to be mowing it. The problem with me, though, is what on earth can I do with set aside, apart from having a few birds nest on it? I've racked my brains because I'm not allowed to use it. I'm not allowed to graze a pony or a donkey or even a baboon. But I think I've got the answer. And the answer is, turn it into a playground. But it's a jolly big playground, and you need a jolly big toy. It's a crazy way to run a countryside, and I could witter on for hours about all the other benefits farmers enjoy. We don't pay rates on our buildings or land, we get lovely inheritance tax concessions, and then there was that small matter of the four billion pounds we received to bail us out after BSE. Last week, I suggested that farm subsidies should be phased out over a five-year period, after which we'd live or die in the free market. It would mean I'd have to compete with the prairie farmers of Kansas, and that won't be much fun. But I reckon I'd just survive. 
Most of my fellow farmers think I'm mad and irresponsible to even suggest such a thing. So be it. One of the stormtroopers of the status quo lives on the outskirts of swinging, sun-drenched Basingstoke. It was time to face my critics. Hugh Oliver Bellasis is a conservative in every sense of the word. He is, I'm forced to admit, an even bigger farmer than me with 3,500 acres. He's a wee bit richer too, since he's just sold off 100 acres for new houses and pocketed around 50 million quid. So what have we got here, Hugh? Beef cattle. They look like limousines. Some limousine, uh, some Frisian Hereford mums, some Salaire mums. Hugh's farm is a good old-fashioned mix of cattle, sheep and crops. He's proud of the fact that he's different to most of his neighbours who, like me, have specialised in cereals. So what have you done on this farm that perhaps I haven't done on my farm? Well, I would think we've been particularly careful over insecticides, both in the summer and uh, in the winter. And I think we've learnt how to use herbicides better in that we're not perhaps using them in the quantity we used to. We certainly have kept people employed to do those jobs that require pairs of hands. Now, what have we got for it? We've got wildflowers that people didn't know were there. We've got butterflies. We've got all sorts of things which have come as a result of that. I came across a farmer in Yorkshire not so long ago who actually sprayed out the bottom of all his hedges, an arable farmer. What yeah. would you say to him? Oh, well, I know who you're talking about, and uh, what he says is complete and utter rubbish. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's got no science to back up what he's saying. And he, at the same time, is getting farmers a bad name and doing all of us a huge disservice. So what should he do? If he were sitting here instead of me, if Hepworth was sitting here, what would you say to him right well, now? Well, I would, I, before the conversation could take place, I would have to actually explain to him, which at the moment he doesn't either understand or believe, the value of what we've got here in terms of the natural habitat. The point I would make, though, is that at the end of the day, if subsidy is or support is to be reduced, then we will look at this business in a very different way to the way that we look at it now. So you're saying that the subsidies you get from Brussels, how much are they, by the way? Quite a lot. Go on, tell me. No, go on. I'm not going to tell you Why? how much Now, wait a minute. This is fascinating, Hugh. This is really interesting. Every single farmer in this country says, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to chase you on these subsidies because I'm going to tell you how much you get. All I had to do was to add up the acres you tell me you farmed and multiply, and you get a cheque for 266,833 quid, which is rather more than mine. Not surprising, your farm's bigger. But why on earth are you nervous about talking about I'm it? I'm not nervous about it Of course you are. You didn't I... even want to tell me. Come well, on. I thought I knew you'd have worked it. I thought it would be rather fun for you to tell me how much I was getting. OK, touche, and it is rather fun. <laughs> and I have to say to you, given that the money comes from the public, why on earth are farmers so nervous about talking about their cheques? Because, uh, nervous or not, and whether it's right or wrong, it's very easy to assume that sums of money that are paid to farmers of whatever size uh, are actually indecent or whatever for whatever reasons. The fact is, it's how the farm is run, how many people are employed, and what that farm actually produces at the end of the day. Now, it's interesting hearing you say this, Hugh, and, and obviously what you say is true. You do employ a lot more people on this farm than most farms of a similar size. But, and this is a big but, there is no trickle-down effect that I can yet see. There certainly isn't on my farm. I would love to be able to say to you, thanks to my Brussels subsidy check, I've now employed five extra people. But I'd be a bloody liar if I told you that. Yeah, OK. Uh, but I think you make my point eloquently. What you choose to do and what others choose to do is a matter for them. But I would contend that this system under the current regime is supporting people and an ecosystem in terms of the countryside as a whole, which is what some people in the country, government included, perceive they want. And here I must differ. The reason Hugh can farm the way he does is not because of his subsidy check from Brussels. It's simply because he's a jolly rich chap and can afford the higher costs and lower yields his type of farming involves. How would you feel if you woke up tomorrow morning, opened your newspaper, which I assume is the Daily Telegraph, and read the following headline? All farm subsidies to stop in five years' time. All of them. 
would you say whoopee or would you say my god and start looking for property prices in the Bahamas? No, I, I, I wouldn't say whoopee because that would be disingenuous, but I would well, look, I would, be disingenuous. I would, I, I, what I would do is to say, okay, if that's the rule of the game, I will look at that and work out how I run my business. But you ain't going to get the other bits. You're not going to get the hedgerows we've looked at today. You're not going to get the woods. You're that's not going to get any. You're no. blackmailing. No, you no. are blackmailing the government, saying, Fine. unless you pay me something, I'm not going to look at In which the case, woods. they take away all the regulations which are to do with environment, hedgerow legislation, water legislation, and so on. The fact is that those things are the difference between you and I and a global market. Actually, he's got a point. When the day finally comes and the last production subsidy disappears into the sunset, Hugh and I and all other farmers must receive financial help for looking after the countryside. But at least we shall be being paid for doing what the public wants us to do, and not, as we are today, being paid for producing taller grain mountains. Still, I don't expect much sympathy for a couple of fat cats like us who share almost half a million pounds from Brussels. Driving west from Basingstoke, I felt I was back in the real world where the farmers don't have personalized number plates. This is where the hardship is today. It's also here that the CAP's idiocy is seen at its clearest. 80% of farmers, the small ones, receive a mere 20% of CAP subsidies. Liscard in Cornwall is just about the most westerly outpost, I suppose, of English agriculture. I came here six years ago with a farmer from Bodmin Moor called John Goodenough, and I'm going to meet him any moment now in the market. Now, six years ago, Liscard cattle and sheep market was a thriving operation. I have a feeling today it'll be a little more subdued. The number of farmers is getting smaller, and the whole market structure is crumbling under pressure from the supermarkets. But in the meanwhile, Liscard remains a well, a lovely market town. It's different from my neck of the woods. There's been a livestock market at Liscard for hundreds of years. For most of the farmers, it's been the centre of their social as much as their commercial life. I was struck by the age of people here, which is a clear indication of the way things are going. Young men just don't want to work as hard as their fathers for so little reward, and I can't blame them. John Goodenough, how are you? Oh, well, I feel bad. Have you sold anything today? Yeah, yeah, down another ring. What was it like? What was the price like? Very poor. Really? How much? Cattle this size was making 171 pounds and 180. Why is it so low right now? Is it particularly bad today? No, this is the runner. This is what it's got like. I, I don't know what what we want to do really. Now that you've sold yours, are you going back home? Yeah, yeah. Can I come along with you? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's go and look at some real farming. Yeah. <laughs> John farms 300 acres on Bodmin Moor. He raises calves and lambs, which he sells on at market to lowland farmers who fatten them up for slaughter. His subsidy last year was £12,000. John, you've had a miserable day at the market. You work terribly long hours. You've got soil that's so bad I wouldn't dream of farming it myself. Why on earth do you continue farming up here on Bodmin Moor? God knows. Can't know no better. But is there ever going to come a day when you say to hell with it? Well, I should say you isn't too far away. You serious? After today, yes. After today. When you reckon £171 pound for a, for a year lump. Now, hang on a minute. All farmers whinge the whole time. Then I bet you've never yeah. sold an animal at, at the market that you've been satisfied with the price. Yes, I have at one time. When? Uh, back in 1950. Back in the 50s, I took five... Uh, suckle yearlings to five lanes fair and I come home with 200 pounds. I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. You're making my point for me, John. That means once in 40 years you've been happy. That's right. But you must be making a slight bob or two as well. Last year I had the accountant do my uh, accounts for two years, right? And my bottom line, what was it for the two year? What was it? 
509 pounds so you're for two years bloody work but do you think that the government all the taxpayers should support you and pay you money because they love john goodenough not because they love john goodenough but because john goodenough is one of many that looks after the countryside so you wouldn't mind if the if the government said to you john stay where you are farm your farm and we're going to pay you because we think you keep bobbing more pretty yeah because that's, that, that's the only answer. That's the only answer for our survival, and is the only answer for the countryside in this area. This is a really exciting moment in my life. It's the first time I've come to the Vatican, to the mecca of football, for me anyway. This is my brick. I paid 25 quid for it, and it's now in the wall of the new Stadium of Light. And I'm here with the Sunderland are playing Bradford City in just a minute, and I hope we're going to thrash them. I've been a Sunderland supporter through thin and thin all my life, and I've made the pilgrimage today with my wife and daughter. 17 to 20. Out of the wreckage of shipyards and coal mines, this stadium has risen as a symbol of what can be done. It all goes to show what happens if you stop subsidizing industries and instead subsidize communities and people. By all means, pay John Goodenough to stay on Bodmin Moor, but don't pay me simply to plant more wheat. In the meanwhile, I feel happier here than anywhere outside Tripoli. This is because of a passion, a real gut-twisting passion, for 11 men in red and white stripes. It's all about to begin, but I'm sorry, you can't see the game because the BBC just doesn't own the rights. So I'll see you at half-time. It's nil-nil now at halftime, a scrappy game, and I'm a bundle of nerves. So I've come out into the foyer, rather a grand foyer, to speak to Bryn Sidaway, who's the leader of the Sunderland City Council. That's right. Because the reason I'm interested in how you feel about farmers is because the industry that we're in, farming, is still and has been very heavily subsidized, whereas the industry that you've had up here, coal and, and shipbuilding, the subsidies are finished. Why? Well, perhaps the Tory government had a view that they needed to continue the common agricultural policy subsidies because most of the people in the rural areas are thought to be conservative voters. I'm sure that one of the reasons we lost our subsidies was because people in the mines and the shipyards were considered to be Labour Party voters. So it was straight party political pressure? Yes. I'm sure that I'm positive of that. Well, we better go back and start shouting our lungs out <laughs> because we're going to win this game. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Uh, thanks sure a lot. <laughs> Great. The reason why we farmers get all those subsidies is, I reckon, a bit more complicated than that. Anyway, next week I head for the hills to find out how the remotest communities of Britain would fare in a world without subsidies. Could hill farming survive? What a boring game. Nil-nil. Hardly worth coming all the way up. I think I'll stick to farming.